prayed a lot um, so we could we could have our baby in my arms. Always wanted to run around with my child, play with him, be on the swings, go out, play sports, but none of that was happening. Babies would usually focus, look us in the eye. Jamil doesn't seem to do that. If I move my hand around him, there is something not right. He, he does not follow my hand or when I talk to him, he doesn't look at me. And the only treatment was bone marrow transplant. If the bone marrow transplant does not work, his life is going to be difficult, as in he is going to lose a limb at a time. From the doctor's expertise, most children don't survive past the age of eight. I was the one who said, Mustafa, let's be prepared, you know. We can say our last goodbyes to Jamil. He may never come out of the hospitals. I was thinking, I've already lost Ali, ya Allah, are you going to test me again with this one as well? He couldn't have made it, but he made it past eight years. He made it past 10 years and it's going to be 11 soon. So yeah, we made it, Alhamdulillah. I want to see him as a grown adult making some kind of mark in the world. And I'd like to see that. And I know it's possible. We realized slowly he was picking up one and he himself realized that he could memorize. He was, we were all surprised to be honest. He recites so beautifully now he's become my teacher. <laughs> he's the best. And it's not just because he's a physically challenged. He recites well. The eloquence, the fluency, the maharaj. Pass off to his mom and dad. How long would this have taken for him to learn this? But then I thought, well his age is young. So then how many hours has he put in? Well then, there's only 24 hours in the day. So that means, is there a miraculous aspect to this? وأذنت لربها وحقت This is an extraordinary story about a young child who despite being faced with unbearable challenges from the start of life finds hope and inspiration to rise above his peers and exceeds the expectations placed upon him by society, family and even himself. This is the story of Jamil. <laughs> It's no. This is Mustafa and Soraya. Mustafa works as a stock controller and Soraya is a qualified early years practitioner. They got married in 2006 and settled in Birmingham. For this couple, the journey to starting a family was not what they had anticipated. The wait was long and they were faced with pain and heartache on more than one occasion. Before we conceived Jamil, I went through two miscarriages and each one of them was really difficult and hard because every time you have that hope, you're gonna you know, carry on with the pregnancy, have your baby. So it was really difficult. We were really trying to have children, but it wasn't happening. Ali's pregnancy, my firstborn, who of course didn't survive, and he passed away 13 minutes after birth. So knowing, having that in our mind, Jamil's pregnancy was always difficult and Every single day of that pregnancy, both me and my wife, of course, we were like, you know, is he fine? Have you had your appointments? 
what's the doctor saying, let me have a look at the picture. And of course, I was always there constantly asking the doctor questions. Is this baby absolutely fine? And they could see nothing. There was nothing wrong with Jamil, absolutely perfectly fine. And they were like, yeah, it's a normal baby. There is nothing wrong. Prayed a lot um, so we could we could have our baby in my arms, obviously. And I think our prayers were heard, alhamdulillah. And we had Jamil in April 2011. It was beautiful. I think um, <laughs> that was the best moment in my life. Um, I was so overjoyed. I mean, I can't describe that moment, but yes, all the pain that we go through, the labor birthing had just gone out of the window as soon as I had him in my arms. You know, it was very happy, joyous. My mom was happy, my parents, everybody was happy. You know, me being the oldest son in the family, so that was my first child. So, you know, my, my mom had the opportunity to become a grandmother at that time, so she was very happy, emotional. Jamil's arrival was the ease after the immense hardship the family had endured. However, from the moment he was born, doctors showed some concerns regarding the size of his head and decided to monitor his development. When Jamil was about two, two and a half months, uh, the family had started showing concern, saying that by this age, babies would usually focus, look us in the eye. Jamil doesn't seem to do that and he used to roll his eyes up a lot. No, if I move my hand around him, there is something not right. He, he does not follow my hand or when I talk to him, he doesn't look at me like other children do or when the TV comes on, he doesn't move his head towards that. After many tests and MRI scans, that's when they broke the news to us that he cannot see. Understandably, this news came as a shock to the family. Jamil had no vision and the medical team needed to investigate why that was the case. And they did the biopsy and confirmed that yes, Jamil has got osteopetrosis and that's what's caused the condition of his osteopetrosis started from his head. It can start from any part of your body. Of course, if it had started from his hands or legs, then those parts of his body wouldn't have worked, but because it started from his head, it's impacted his eyes. Osteopetrosis is a bone condition. Um, it's characterized as overly dense bones in our body. And in Jamil's case, the osteoclasts that are responsible to reshape, remodel the bones are not functioning. They're either not there or they're not functioning. They're not doing the job. Basically, the bones inside his eyes literally locked up. So there's no connection between his eyes and the brain. And that is the reason his eyes are perfectly fine, but he cannot see. Um, and the only treatment was bone marrow transplant. If the bone marrow transplant does not work, his life is going to be difficult as in he is going to lose a limb at a time. Or the worst case scenario was that the bone marrow transplant completely fails, nothing happens, and from the doctor's expertise, most children don't survive past the age of eight. Um, I just couldn't carry Jamil. So they took him away from me and uh, so yeah, I just had to pull myself together, sorry. And she was looking at me and I was thinking, I have no answer for you. The doctor is saying something, I don't know what this condition is, I've never heard about it. And I, I have no answer. I, I, I was thinking, I've already lost Ali, ya Allah, are you going to test me again with this one as well? At that moment, um, I think my world had just ended there. It was, it was hard. Um, my tears just wouldn't stop rolling. I was shaking, was the fact to take Jamil off me. And uh, the doctors went quiet as well. We were all trying to put the things together. After many more hospital visits, Zoraya and Mustafa found a glimmer of hope, their only hope, a bone marrow transplant to save his life. Time was ticking and the family were torn between absorbing the news and acting fast before it was too late. My mind had gone into sort of a lockdown and 
you know, I was trying to focus on what to do for the child rather than, okay, he's got a problem, the doctor's giving me all this information, am I absorbing it? On that same day that we had visited clinic, um, they said, go back home, pack your bags and uh, come back to hospital. I was like, we were like, we haven't even crashed one news, why are you admitting us to hospital? There was that urgency, they had to get things done very quickly. They said, if we don't act fast, more damage will happen. It, it was a very difficult period, you know, watching your child being absolutely normal. Okay, the doctor's broken the news to you, but you can't see anything wrong. And then suddenly going through that process of chemotherapy and transplant, and when your child goes really, really poorly, and that is when, what, when you realize what's actually happening to that child and going through that twice in, in five years time. And that was very difficult period, yes. Yeah, very difficult. In order to prepare Jimmy's body for the bone marrow transplant, he needed to undergo chemotherapy first to weaken his immune system and to prevent his body from rejecting the donated cells after the transplant had taken place. He had to go through two life-saving bone marrow transplants, uh, two because the first one failed gradually over two years. Um, and uh, he needed to have intensive chemotherapy uh, for the bone marrow transplant to happen and the chemotherapy came with a lot of side effects, um, a lot of complications where Jamil would not be able to tolerate his feeds. He would get sick to the extent he would be throwing up blood and because he's lost so much blood, he would need immediate blood transfusion, platelet transfusions. That was during first time around with this transplant. A central line was also attached to his heart to put all the medication into him, so he had to go through that process as well. And uh, then as the chemotherapy progressed, he, beca he became much more unwell. He started losing his hair and his skin started turning really brown like a severe sunburn so by day 13 14 when the chemotherapy was about to finish and the bone marrow transplant was to take place he'd lost a lot of weight his eyes were literally popping out his skin was totally burnt with the second transplant the side effects were slightly different uh, the because the chemotherapy was a little different and some of the intense side effects were like his, it, the chemotherapy sort of burnt his skin and then his skin would start healing and that was so painful for him. It was, it was really, really hard. It came with a lot of complications. His oxygen levels would go down. He wasn't eating, drinking, barely awake. And then the bone marrow transplant happened. Of course, his immune system was completely gone. And by day six, I think we were put into isolation. So before the bone marrow transplant, so there was a lot of washing hands. We couldn't go out much. We had to try and stay with him, eat there, sleep there. I kept on praying. And at one point, I was like, hey Allah, you've, you've given this to me. I, I don't know. You know it better. You've given it to me. Give me the strength. Please give me the strength to help Jamil get through this. Give me the strength so we as family can get through this. We, don't, we didn't know what was coming. I don't know if I'm being tested or punished. I don't know which one it is. Uh, I was lost. There was very little hope left and I was trying to search and seek everywhere where I could find hope from. But to be honest, me and Mustafa had a long conversation before we went for the second one and I was the one who said, Mustafa, let's be prepared, you know, we can say our last goodbyes to Jamil. He may never come out of the hospital, so... Yeah, we went, I think, 
I may have been crying, but I was prepared that Jamil may never come back home. So we went and Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, can't thank Allah enough. I have Jamil at home with me now and I say he couldn't have made it, but he made it past eight years. He made it past 10 years and it's going to be 11 soon. So yeah, we made it, Alhamdulillah. Jamil is recovering well and continues to thrive. However, the risk remains that Jamil's bone marrow transplant can fail again at any time. But for now, Jamil is closely monitored under the care of his medical team. Things seem to finally settle down and the family welcomed a new addition, Mohammed Kamil. Now Jamil had the lifelong companion and friend. The family unit was now complete. However, to their surprise, things took another turn. The school raised some concerns and Jamil was now being investigated for another condition. Uh, when Jamil started going to the school and uh, we, we realised that, yeah, he may have had delays because he's missed the first three, three and a half years of his life locked up away from people at the hospital. He's, he hasn't had much interaction with people. He's visually impaired, of course. He hasn't seen anybody, so he doesn't know how people talk, how people react. He doesn't know any of that, but still his speech was delayed a lot. A lot of the nurses and therapists that were coming home and they were like, we suspect there is something there. We are not sure, we can't say it, but get it checked up. So we did. And yeah, after a couple of visits with the pediatrician, he was diagnosed as autistic as well. Autism is a complex, lifelong developmental disability that typically appears during early childhood and can impact a person's social skills, communication, relationships and self-regulation. He does not understand simple sentences, simple um, instructions. He would constantly repeat things. There was that equilalia, anything that he would hear. He would just repeat even if he doesn't know what it meant. He's got these sentences that he's memorized in his brain that he keeps using again and again even this, if the situation changes the sentence stays the same. Level one, level two, level four, I missed level three. I need to go down when I have one. Level four, level three, I missed level three. I need to go down when I have one. Level five, level six, level eight, level ten, level twelve. When we found out Jimmy was visually impaired, I would do a lot of research and I would have hope like, oh, even if they're blind, they are able to do a lot of things with the help of technology, all the gadgets out there. So it's very hopeful. But when the news of autism came, I was like, this is a double difficulty for him to deal with now. He can't see. And then if he doesn't understand things because of his autism, life is going to be so much more difficult for him. How is he going to do things? How is he going to live? How is he going to be independent? So all those worries came. That on its own has brought out a different type of beauty, I would say, in Jamil. And it's given him something extra, I would say, not less. Grab the handrail. There you go. Well done. See, you've done it. Have you come down? He's riding those bikes today. You did, you did the wrong way around. Do it the right way round. Come on then. Jamil now lives at home with his parents and younger brother. The family home has been uniquely adapted to cater for his needs. 
Soraya makes an extra effort to organise their home in a way that helps Jamil find his way around easily and locate the items and objects he needs on a day-to-day -day basis. This is to foster his independence and allow him to thrive as an individual. We asked his parents to speak to us more about his daily challenges and how he is able to overcome them. He self-taught himself how to use the accessibility function on the iPad. So he knows the iPad or any Apple device for that matter inside out. The settings, the notification sounds, what each notification is called because he spent so much time on it. And that's helping him get information in terms of learning. If he's not sure of anything, um, oh, ask Siri all the questions and he gets it. I think level one, two, three, four, five, six is fun, but and nine is fun, but seven and eight is boring for me. Jamil's biggest challenge is growing up. From my point of view, it's been everything. Everything has been a challenge for Jamil. I always wanted to run around with my child, play with him, be on the swings, go out, play sports, but none of that was happening. So we had to figure out a different way of being able to play with him while sitting down. But slowly and gradually we started to realize that all these things that we thought he didn't have, people loved him for that. And many people approached him because he could love you unconditionally. Whether you gave him something or you didn't, all he wanted was your attention and care. And he could just love you. He, he, he was there and Jamil goes and talks to other people without looking at their color. He will hug them. He will talk to them. As long as he's getting love and attention from them, he does not know what clothes they are wearing, what color they are, what car they came in. Jamil's strength, uh, both us at home and school, has uh, learned that he's very good with numbers. Um, literacy doesn't make sense to him at all. Even a simple sentence wouldn't understand, but maths and numbers, working things out. Numbers is his strength and technology, gadgets. He just absolutely loves and he grasps a concept straight away it takes me time to understand how to use a certain thing but he just picks it up so quickly our camera crew went to visit jamil at his school to find out more about the methods used to assist him in his learning he now attends a resource-based junior school for the visually impaired where he is continuing his education alongside other sighted children in a mainstream setting at school jamil is supported by a specially qualified teacher for the visually impaired and by a habilitation specialist who teaches children and young people with a visual impairment to move around as safely, efficiently and independently as possible. I am Susie MacDonald, I'm a habilitation specialist and a habilitation specialist works on all of the mobility and independent skills um, of a child with a visual impairment. So if we're talking about mobility, that might, that's how they move from A to B and that they understand where they are in that process. Obviously sighted children learn things by looking and so they learn things very incidentally uh, because they see their parents doing it, they see things on the telly, but if it's a child with a visual impairment there's lots and lots of gaps in their knowledge so we have to start right from if you take the example of pouring, do they know what a jug is, do they know what a cup is, do they know the difference between a cup and a glass and how balanced they are, do they, are they able to pour? Put your liquid level indicator on your cup. It's is it a cup or it's a mug more like? <laughs> okay. It's a mug more like. Yep, yeah, you're absolutely right. In this lesson, Jamil is using a liquid indicator to learn how to pour water from a jug into a cup. First, he needs to attach the liquid indicator on the cup independently. Then, as the jug is filled up, the indicator will release a beeping sound to indicate that it's almost full. Such tasks require many hours of practice, patience and precision. It is such tasks that the majority of us take for granted on a daily basis. Make sure you check where your spout is. That's Lovely. As your spout, spot on. And then let's have your hand a bit further over. There we go. Slow and steady. Second. 
second sound. Well done. So you didn't stop at the first, you carried on to the second. Is that right? Yeah. That was loads better. But, but the second sound is a beep, beep, beep factor. It is? Yes, you get a whole load of qualifications, but if you can't make yourself a meal, you're not going to survive very well. So we do all of those other bits. And you wanted to use a knife or a spoon? A spoon. Okie dokie. All right then, do you want to roll your sleeves up? Why are you saying sleeves up? Be do you want chocolate on your sleeves? No. No, so roll your sleeves up. There's one. There's two. Okay. There are two sleeves. There are? Yep. Okay, so can you open your chocolate spread? Does it open at the left or the right if I wouldn't? I think it opens at the left and closes at the right. Spot on. Jamia's level of patience and motivation to learn is truly inspiring. Unable to visualise what he has in front of him, he relies on the guidance of those around him. Many of us will not appreciate the effort he makes unless we were asked to make a sandwich blindfolded. To use your spoon to dig into the I, chocolate spread. Try standing. Try maybe. standing if you think that's easier. Yes, okay. I'll try standing if I think that's easier. Brilliant. Okay. So remember, you've got to dig that spoon in. Dig it spoon in until you know you've got some chocolate on it. Okay, and then pull your spoon out. Oh, have a check with your fingers. Is there any on there? Just hardly little. Mm, do you think we need some more? We need to keep trying. Mm -hmm. So dig it in again and try and tilt your spoon so you're lifting it out with some on. Does that feel better? Have you got some on there? It's on the back and not at the front. Okay, so do we need to get it onto your crumpet? Yeah. So how are you going to get it onto your crumpet? Don't worry about your fingers because we can wash them afterwards. Let's get that chocolate from the spoon onto your crumpet. I'm getting it on the crumpet. Go on then. Do I need to move back and forth, back and forth? You do, spot on. The chocolate crumpet has been made and is now ready to be eaten. But who will eat it? Do you want to wash your hands first? Or do you want to, because there is, there's still chocolate on the crumpet, so if you eat your crumpet, you might still get chocolate on your hands. So I would eat your crumpet. Why did it say you will eat my crumpet? So, sorry, you eat your crumpet, and then you can wash your hands. Jamil is using a long cane to move around, and as we'll see, he has a cane that touches the floor, so his cane finds things in front of him, which helps him with his mobility, because again, as we said, it tells you where you are in that environment that you're in and it tells you if there's steps coming up because your cane drops down the steps or it tells you that there's a change in surface because your cane makes a slightly different vibration when it's touching the floor on a, on a carpeted surface as opposed to a hard surface. He can use his cane and his tactile skills as well by trailing and finding objects, landmarks in an environment. He can use what he finds to get himself back on track and to follow his route again. So he's made excellent progress on his mobility. It's really good to see. Couldn't hear it. And this way. Couldn't from the right. Are we okay? I think we must be okay. Okay, go on then. But if I hear some cars, I wouldn't be okay. No, but you didn't hear any cars, did you? So let's go as quick as we can across the zebra crossing, wow. moving your cane side to side. Tick tock, tick tock. Good boy. Brilliant. I'll become a tip top lollipop when I go fast. See if you can find that drop curb so you get back onto the pavement. So can you find the drop curb? Oh, oh quick, onto the pavement. We caught up with Jamil's class teacher who showed us the devices he uses to aid his learning and gave us an insight into Jamil's academic progress and how far he has come to reach this remarkable stage. Well, I'm, my name's Mary Ellen Flynn and I'm the um, coordinator of the VI base, resource base at World's End um, and I'm also a qualified teacher of the visually impaired, a QTVI. Having you know, reflected on where he began, it's just wonderful to see him now in year six doing what he can do 
and participating as much as he can in a mainstream school. Thinking back to where he started, because I am aware of where he started, um, and everything he's overcome, he now, he can access the curriculum using grade two braille, which is the highest level of braille. He's doing maths um, in braille completely. He's um, able to um, write documents using a, using a brailler or a braille note. Braille is written on um, a brailler and this is used by simply putting the paper into the brailler and then he can then use the keys to, uh, in, in to write his braille. The next piece of equipment that he, he can use and which he's been learning very well is using this um, braille note and it's a braille note is basically like a computer but with a braille reader. Um, I can see you're spelling it correctly, so that's good. It's family. Yeah. Okay. It's family. Good. Next word, number two. Do I need to full stop after family or not? Uh, yes. Space. He, he reads books completely in grade two braille. And um, he can read perfectly. He's got a very good... Um, ability to decode and read words. Where he does need support is then um, comprehending it at a deeper level. You got 67%, but that's 96. Or 85.2, it said you should repeat. Right. Yeah. But oh yeah, he did 60 something first, and then you're better with the numbers so than me. was 57 point Yeah, and I don't want him to be outside of society. I want him to be inside of society. And whatever we can do to get him the skills to do that, that's what I want. I want Jamil to do whatever he can do, and I know that's possible. I mean, it, it, it takes work, I understand that. But for Jamil, with how he is, and his open-heartedness, and everything, and I want to see him as a grown adult, making some kind of mark in the world, and I'd like to see that. And I know it's possible. I always get a bit emotional. I don't know why. <laughs> Perhaps his teacher is unaware that Jamil is already leaving his mark on the world. Alongside his impressive academic progress, Jamil had other hidden talents waiting to be uncovered. Soraya and Mustafa came to realise that Jamil has an appetite for learning the Holy Qur'an and memorising chapters and verses of it. We asked his parents to share with us the extraordinary journey. I had always wanted him to learn to read Quran and I hadn't thought of the memorization at all but I was like all children read Quran how will Jamil read Quran and I started um, researching on braille Quran when he was very little and I found out that you can only introduce Arabic braille to children after eight years of age after they have mastered their English braille. He recites so beautifully now he's become my teacher. <laughs> And yes, his mother's, his mom's put a lot of effort into it, but he's showed potential and he became really good at it. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Iza waqa'atil waqa'a Laysa li waqa'atiha kaziba um, he's done all his Arabic letters, joining, he reads it in Braille, all the Tajweed rules, and he literally enjoys it. I'm on page 37. Are you on page 37? Yes. We have put that into routine in the morning. Before he goes to school, he does his memorization. After he comes back from school, he does his Braille Quran, so he's learning to read. Rauf al Rahim. Very good. Let's go to the next one. So, when I was expecting Jamil, when I was expecting Ali, with all the pregnancies, and I was expecting Jamil, if I'm doing any dhikr, if I'm reciting Quran, I would do it loudly. We always hear that babies can hear us, so. Even though if I'm listening to any audio in the car at home, but if I'm reciting, I talk to my babies and say, I'm reciting the Holy Quran, I'm reciting this particular surah. We realized slowly 
he was picking up one and he himself realized that he could memorize. He was, we were all surprised to be honest. Which is surah number 60? Al Munafiqun. Uh, 50. Qaf. And 70. And he was listening to Quran every day, and then he would say, Okay, mom, which surah is that am I listening to today? And Suraya would be like, Okay, this surah, and then the next surah the day after, and shorter surahs went by. And soon we realized as the days went past, and uh, he would be able to literally count 17 surahs and say, Okay, I've, I know this, know this, know this, know this. What's the next one? I want to listen to the next one. Nine. Yunus, Hud, Yusuf, Arad, Ibrahim, Al Hajr, Al Nahal, Bani Israel. And Surah is like, okay, you know these surahs, let's start reciting. So he started reciting then and he, he remembered and he memorized and he memorized more and he was getting really excited about it. So then we said, okay, a competition is coming. Competition day came, we took part and everybody was actually surprised. We were surprised. Um, the judges were absolutely surprised and he surprised us by doing so well that he got the second position. Second, Qarib Kabir, inshallah. Inshallah. The Sheikh was saying how impressed he is uh, and he was saying that he thanks he thanks the parents for looking after him and helping him and teaching him. And he said if he continue, he feels that he's got potential to become a very amazing father. Inshallah. 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 Yeah, and, and he's also saying that he's honoured that he got to listen to him. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And then Jamil comes along with his uh, mum, I believe. She, she bought him uh, and we mic'd him up. And then he started reciting, putting his hand next to his face. And uh, in my mind, I thought, oh, yeah, like Sheikh Abdul Basim put his hand up. And, you know, it gave me a little giggle in, inside me to see that, some, some happiness to see that. He started reciting and I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, wow. I think the first thing was like, how accurate is his recitation? It's so accurate that then automatically I felt like I'm going to leave the, uh, the marking scheme. And I'm going to, for my sake, try to mic mark him on a higher level that befits him. And he was just exceeding that, so then I upped my level of marking in my mind and he's exceeding that as well. Not just with memory, but with the makharij, with the tafkhim, tarqiq, rules, etc. And we have been listening to Sheikh Husari's recitation and uh, Sheikh Mishra al Afasi as well. So. Uh, I was, and did I listen to Nabila Auntie Zona? <laughs> yes. You did as well. You did. When are we going to go for closing ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> You'll be surprised later thank on you. what your results are. Okay? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you to the judges. What are your names? What's your name? Uh, the chef also says that he requests that you don't give up on this and carry on until he's Definitely. memorized the Quran. Inshallah. I want to be the judge. Inshallah. One day. Jamil. You know, Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah. He has surpassed his peers when it comes to Islamic knowledge. <laughs> In fact, I remember some parents were telling me, you know, Sheikh, Jamil participated in this competition has challenged us not to fold our arms and wait for the competition to be announced before we start even planning and preparing our kids. Jamil has challenged us and we're going to make sure throughout the year we'll do something about Quran. So the impact he had, not only on the participant, even on us as judges, sitting there, watching and listening to Jamil reciting, is telling us as judges that, you know what, we can also take our relationship 
with the Holy Quran to the next level. He's the best. He's the best. And it's not just because he's a physically challenged. He recites well. The eloquency, the fluency, the maharij. Pass off to his mom and dad. By 2020, he was able to enter the Lady Fizza Quran competition again, but this time memorizing longer chapters and verses and even taking the lead into first position. <laughs> I feel my heart is flying. We revisited Al Abbas Center in Birmingham where Sheikh Nur Muhammad is the Imam. This is where Jamil regularly attends with his family and where the Lady Fizza Quran competition takes place. Waiting for us was Brother Muhammad Ali, one of the judges of the Quran competition. <laughs> Jamil recited some verses of the Holy Quran to him and received some encouraging feedback about the progress that he continues to make. From what I've seen of him since then, his nature and attitude, first of all, he's very, very committed. Second of and I would say that because when he wants to, he will do it 100%. When he doesn't, it's as if he's saying, I want a complete break. So as if he's recharging. So I don't think, I think he's an all or nothing. And that's why the task that he's taken on, uh, that he has a passion with Quran, is a complete all in his energy. It's not 60%, it's not 80%, it's a full 100%. I feel that what they've achieved is at such a level that I don't feel qualified to give any advice or any hinters, uh, hints or tips. Do you know what's like really amazing? First of all, you knew exactly where to start, exactly where 10 verses were. And that's very difficult when me and you are doing it together. And it's just your tajweed rules, subhanAllah, how you say, Abu Sam Tarira, you go from the nasal of the noon, the ghunna of the noon, towards the tafkhim of the qaf, because the qaf has a fatha. The way you flow through that ikhfa, a lot of people might say Abu Sang Qam Tarira, but it's Sang Qam Tarira. Very, very good. There was a moment when uh, the first time he recited the Holy Quran at the mosque for the competition. And at that time, I remember all the struggles that I've been through that have given me the white beard and the worrying that I have gone through. It made me realize when, when was I in charge of the situation? When was I in control? It is not me who's done this. It's not me who woke him up from that bed. It's not me who's got him past the age of eight that he may not have. So why am I going through so much worrying? Why so much stress? I am not in power. I am not in charge. And that's when I realized that I just need to step back and do what's good for him and then go to bed and sleep. That's it, that's my part done. 
and then let Allah take care of the rest because that's all I am doing. I'm not in control. And I think that's his biggest strength is he inspires people in a different way. He gives us a different way of looking at the larger picture. يغفر لكم ذنوبكم ويدخلكم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ومساكن طيبة في جنات عد ذلك الفوز العظيم Jamil had now become a celebrity, not just in his community, but even beyond. He had been fully immersed in the love of the Qur'an, and in return, the Qur'an had become his lifelong companion. His eyes had no sight, but they radiated love, joy, and beauty, just like his name. His parents spoke to us in more details about how hard he works to get to where he is now. One of the judges who said he was so, he was so happy, and he said, don't stop. Inshallah, one day he'll become an amazing Qari. And those words stuck to me and I was like, yes, we're not stopping. Whether competition or not, it got to start and Jamil has the potential. And we carried on. Him and Quran are... Alhamdulillah have become connected sort of a thing and uh, it's become part of his and our life. The boys would not sleep without having the Quran on and we've got this little speaker which has the whole of Holy Quran in it and it comes with a remote with different reciters on it. And I showed Jamil just once how to use that remote. And he decides, he sets up what surah he wants to listen to. He'll set the timer on so the surahs can go off like after 60 minutes or 90 minutes. And that's our bedtime routine, yeah. Every morning before he goes to school, um, we do a few verses while we're waiting for the taxi. So, and now he's got to a point where he decides what surah he wants to do next. So we do Monday to Friday. I let him have a break during the weekend. We say he can just have a free time. But Monday to Friday, we religiously do it every day. I used to recite Quran for them at night, like Suraya recite, does the story time for them. I used to do Quran for them at night. And Jamil would say, Okay, let's go on to this surah. And then I wouldn't do it for five, six, seven days because I was busy. Then I would come back and I'm like, Jamil, which ayah did we leave it on? And he's like, it was this surah and this particular ayah you left it on. And that was seven days ago. I don't even remember what surah I was reciting. And I, I, I was able to exactly, you know, get to the same page and start reciting. And he's like, you are getting to the end and now this is going to be our next surah and he had literally memorized all the surahs you know he knew it in line how they were going to come in the holy quran and yeah this is how he started because he was so good with numbers and memorizing them he started memorizing all the surahs and he <laughs> he, he was and still is correcting me on which surah is going to come next, which, are, which one are we going to recite. And then there came a point when uh, we would think that he's going to sleep at night and he would come and knock our door and say, Mom, I've listened to this surah and the ayah is the same as that surah that I remember from. And I'm like, wow, mashallah, this boy is going to become something special soon. And that's, you know, now Suraya is trying to encourage him to say, yes, this ayah is also in this surah and that surah. If it wasn't for Jamil and the struggles that we've been through and how far away we had become from the holy book and he's brought us back to it to say that, you know, it's not all about just going to mosque and majalis and do matam and 
we we sometimes do disconnect ourselves from the book thinking that you know us being Asians Arabic not being our first language and because we don't understand it we slowly tend to disconnect from the book but yeah he's brought us very very close to it again and he himself always prays and says ya Allah help me to become a beautiful half is of the holy quran so yeah let's see how far we get on with that Jamil's parents both spoke to us affectionately about the support they received from their extended family and community they believe much of their achievement was not coincidental or through pure luck but as a result of powerful prayers by a special individual who encouraged them and kept them going there was support from my parents my mom she's passed away now but very strong woman alhamdulillah and she was like there will come a time you will remember me and you will you know see this child she and i can remember it quite clearly she said i will not be there but you will see this child grow up and he will do miraculous things that you will remember me for and she always used to pray she always used to pray for us alhamdulillah and you know dua of parents gets through to allah so alhamdulillah yeah baba ba ab mujhe koi sakina nahi kehta I definitely think somewhere in this process of his journey and his mother's hard work apart from that somewhere in there I think my mother's duas are somewhere there definitely you know giving us a push keeping us going to you know not to stop and keep going keep moving ehdana sirat al mustaqim صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين As we reflect on the story of Jamil we can't help but ponder over the power of prayers patience and perseverance and the true meaning of surrendering to the will of Allah Jamil's story is a reminder to us all that no matter how difficult a situation can feel there is always light at the end of the tunnel All one has to do is follow that light with absolute faith. So hope and acceptance are the two biggest thing that have to walk hand in hand during this process. And that's all there is to it. Yeah. I've been through this journey with Jamil. I thought he would never recite Quran. I thought how is he going to learn but he's a witness to you all now. I always worried I always wanted him to recite Quran so that worry was there but I would say if we keep persevering pushing our children we'll see where the potential is what they like and nurture those things don't impose what we want them to do every child is unique every child is different so nurture what they are good at what they are happy with if they are happy they'll flourish in whatever they do so keep that hope strong and persevere and just i said don't give up be strong look for things there's tons of things out there for support help i've stopped making plans now i don't and i let you know life take us through this journey and we just walk through it and if we see a glimmer of hope somewhere we try and grab it and then we focus on that just like we did with the holy quran and you know we expand on that we keep pushing to say that yes this is probably his potential so let's keep pushing but inshallah there is one hope that i want him to one day finish memorizing the whole quran and be able to recite it inshallah and muhammad kumail to be able to do the same right you know behind him yeah follow him up and yeah my hope is that one day i'm able to show my face to allah and say that you know i've done my part and you've helped me and you know hopefully i'm doing walking the right path yeah allah has tested me i would say but a lot of people have said if allah has 
if something is happening to you and you're going through trials, which means that Allah is focused on you right now. So use that as an opportunity to find your Lord again rather than to walk away from him. So that's what both me and my wife, we've tried to do. So we've, I would say, Jamil's become our compass to show us where the north is. And yeah, he's guiding us constantly with new challenges. Without an iota of doubt, meeting Jamil is my best experience in Birmingham, seriously. I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart. He's been like a shining beacon and a, uh, an inspiration for the children his own age and for the parents to say, hang on, it wasn't all by himself. His mom and dad did this to him. How did they do that? And that was actually my final thought when he got up and I saw his parents again. I was like, how did they do that? It's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm absolutely proud of him. We never thought we'll get this far, but He's done it. Like I said, we have to persevere from both and be patient. Something that struck me at one point in his life when he started walking, using his cane or using his hands, tracking along the wall. And he used to walk and I used to imagine, I've guided him, I've told him where it's going to be. He doesn't know if it's there. I've told him where the sofa is, so he's going to walk from one room to another room looking for a sofa, not knowing if the sofa is there, but he's going to walk nonetheless, keeping his belief in me that I've given him the right direction and he's going to go and sit there. And that's when I used to think and contemplate that these challenges of his are trying to guide me somewhere that I don't need to see where I'm going, I just need to walk. I've been given a path, there is people there who, are, who have showed me the path, that there is a destination, just walk, keep walking and that's what we've done, alhamdulillah. We've, we've walked and inshallah one day we'll reach.